Well, uh, let's talk a little bit more as we were this morning. I talked more than I intended to this morning. Uh, <coughs> what is anybody's take on this, or did anybody not get their licks in this morning? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the odd and strange and the weird. Um, um, other than hallucinogens, you know, how can we fool this brain away from the ego? Um, it's pretty, pretty difficult. Yeah. I think that's why we're in the situation we're in. Um, I'm talking about things we could do every day, not once a month. I guess. Well. There's no substitute for awareness in any situation. I mean, part of part of the work, I think, is the spectacular episodes of intoxication that break down the boundaries of our personality and reorient us and recast it. But then the other thing is just living that out from day to day. And there's no substitute for hard work. I mean, people say, how can psychedelics be real? You're saying it's some kind of shortcut to spiritual wisdom. Well, it may be a shortcut, but nobody said it's easy. Uh, it isn't easy. No. Uh, it's, it just is that it's ultimately effective. I don't know, I'm, I find myself preaching a doctrine that is hardly welcome in the touchy-feely uh, circles that I'm usually teaching in, which is stifle it. Now, there's a doctrine to take home from the New Age. Stifle it, you know. The ego is much too large. I mean, we need an ego, yes. That's so that if you take somebody to dinner, you know whose mouth to put food in. That's having an ego. But above and beyond that, it becomes uh, uh, sort of superfluous. It's a, it's a habit. Um, it's a bad habit. It's an infantile response that has been culturally supported to the point where it's become uh, uh, institutionalized. Do you believe a person needs a strong enough ego before they can transcend or transform it though the reason I'm saying that is because I've seen a lot of teenagers in the city and then they experiment a lot with drugs and especially with psychedelics and sometimes I wonder if they're really getting anything out of that early experimentation I didn't get into psychedelics until my late 20s so I... well see it's a real complicated question uh civilizations evolve folkways to deal with the drugs that they're interested in and this takes hundreds thousands of years part of the question i hear you asking is you say that these drugs dissolve the ego but aren't some of the people in a weakened ego condition when they come upon them and i think probably you're right it's not clear that the onset of puberty when there's a good deal of psychosexual and endocrine confusion going on anyway is the precise right moment that you want to drop these psychedelics on somebody although this is done in many traditional societies but the the problem is that in societies where there is shamanism there's an understood way to do it there's an understood way to initiate somebody Kids growing up on the streets, taking drugs of all sorts in doses of all sorts, it's very hard to sort it out. You know, I mean, people don't have intent, they don't have focus, they don't have information. They're just, everything is so fragmented in modern life. Part of what all this yammering about shamanism might eventually lead to is the reformation of psychotherapy along the lines of, of a shamanic uh, style so that then uh, you know, people, people could have these voyages, could have the insight into their problems that you get from psychedelics. Also, in um, those cultures and societies where they do use the psychotropic drug at, at puberty, um, I think those societies support the, the 
individual, the child growing up in very positive ways and feed their ego in a very constructive, positive way so that they are not filled with a lot of self-consciousness and self-hatred and lack of self-worth and so forth, a lot of the critical nature that I think um, and the lack of nurturing and attention that a lot of the adolescents grow up in our society with that then get weak egos from adolescence on into adulthood. And I think the developmental um, quality of life <coughs> in different cultures has some a lot to do with one's um, ability to utilize the, the drug, the plants, effectively. Cooperation is just an automatic response among many of these rainforest hunting, gathering people. I mean, when you finish a job, it isn't your job. When you finish a job, you go on and you do another job until all the jobs are done. And, and this is clearly a learned response because these are human beings just like us. But under the extreme pressure of being, you know, 20 people trying to hold it together in the rainforest through gathering, they, they have accepted that the tribal unit is the lowest common denominator and that everything has to operate to, in the light of that. Back here. Um, um, I felt that part of what was being discussed here was the difference between discursive and one-pointed meditation. And uh, discursive meditation is like meditating on you know, the stations of the cross if you're Catholic or the seven sheaths of the self if you're a Hindu. And it, it sort of serves years of doing that as a, establishing a ladder that can take you to the transcendent. And that uh, one-pointed meditation, and even more profoundly, the use of psychedelics can suddenly put you into a transcendent state. And whether you'll have the capacity to get back is the question. And um, so that there might be a role for uh, uh, a period of discursive meditation or uh, an education along that way before something that instantly propelled you into uh, an experience of the transcendent. Um, yes, although um, this, this difficulty getting back is an interesting thing to talk about because I certainly know what you mean. I think everybody who takes psychedelics a lot eventually has a trip that stands their hair on end. And, and the, the, the reasonable fear I've always felt about psychedelics was not that it would kill you. That's not reasonable. Uh, but, but the somewhat murkier question, could it drive you mad? is a little harder to just, of course not, because, hell, why not? I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely rubbing up against those areas. But I have real faith that it is, uh, it's, like getting, it's like flipping a coin and getting it to land on its edge. The psychedelic experience is, it such, represents such a state of disequilibrium that in almost all cases the entire system is striving to return to normal and will do so very quickly. I, you know, my life is built around one spectacular exception where uh, my brother took a bunch of things and had a theory and proceeded to sail off for the better part of three weeks. And, and this sort of brings up another issue. You know, we sit here relatively down and calm and, and uh, we can talk about the LD50 of psilocybin. That's how much you would have to give to 100 mice for 50 of them to die. This is what pharmacologists are all about. But when you're actually stoned in these places, you realize or you have the uh, apparent realization that, of course, the mind is in control and talking about safety. You're only as safe as you think you are, literally. And if for a moment you decide you're not safe, the, the, the state is very fragile. It's skittery. You know, get it going too fast in one direction. It will be very hard to run around and get in front of it and get it halted and moving off in some other direction. Is that what you meant by self-toxicity? 
Did I use that phrase well, this morning? No, in, in a past uh, tape, you, you did mention about oh, you self toxicity, to... self toxicity, and negative effects, possible negative effects. Well, yeah, I think this is what people fear that they are self toxic, and we have all been disempowered. To some degree, we are self toxic. That's a real tragedy. It means we have been made our own enemies. And then, whether we are or not, we all fear self toxicity. This is why in the 60s, when LSD first began to appear, people had such violent reactions to it. You know, Tim Leary said LSD is a psychedelic drug which causes psychotic behavior in people who haven't taken it. (laughs) This is absolutely true. Well, why would a drug that you don't take cause you to become psychotic? It's because the mere fact of its existence is so threatening to you because you know that you're self-toxic. That's what I always felt in the 60s. These people all know they're crazy. And they don't want to get near anything which would perturb their psychic dynamics. They know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're certifiably insane. And they don't want to hear about it. So they're not going to be delving into something which shines a Klieg light on the mechanics (laughs) of the psyche. It's the last thing that they are uh, interested in. Um, If the uh, the definition of ego is the sort of reality... uh, testing mode of the psyche, the psyche's ability to perceive reality, that it almost seems that uh, the psychedelic experience augments the ego to a new level rather than extinguishes the ego, that it gives uh, a truer picture of, of reality. Well, you know, Freud uh, had this concept that he called the superego, and this term has somewhat fallen out of use and because we all tend to be a little more Jungian than that, and and we talk about the collective unconscious. But in a way, I though I'm more sympathetic to Jung, I like the phrase superego because the phrase collective unconscious is a kind of blah concept. It's like a data bank, a repository, where superego seems to imply organization, intelligence, focus, awareness. And uh, what seems to emerge from these psychedelic experiences is that where we expected disorder or the absence of organization, we find order and we find mindedness. The superego seems to be uh, everywhere. So in a way, it, it is like that. It is that you're becoming more informed but it diminishes your personal importance the physical atom of your body you know I mean we believe and it may be true but the question is how important is it that we are each unique and that somehow in this uniqueness is our worth And that if something were to happen to you, we can't replace you with me, and I can't, you can't stand in for me. But, uh, you know, back off to where you're looking at a scale of a thousand years of this stuff, and you see that each one of us actually is expendable. And that the general processes in which we are embedded are so large that it probably doesn't matter who you are. And I could have been you, and you could have been me. Well, then, once you've got that nailed down, uh, oh, being becomes a whole different project. Being is something out there that you do. You garden well, you bear and raise children, you feed people, you build objects. You know, It, it becomes something outside of yourself rather than something interiorized. And I think, you know, thousands and thousands of generations of people were born and lived and went into the ground with this kind of a psychology. And we are all imprisoned by our cultural expectations to such a degree that the real problem is to, is to make ourselves realize how blind we are, how much what we've been taught, the words we use, the expectations we have... Uh, uh, 
Hemasin and the psychedelics show that cultural relativism not as an exercise, not as something that you're convinced of by rational argument, but that you just uh, you just see it immediately. See, I think that we are very malleable creatures and have held many positions in the last 10,000 years vis-a-vis these structures which we call the ego, the superego, the, the self, the unconscious. It's more fluid than we imagine. Uh, language may have emerged only 40,000 years ago. Well, imagine that. Language is the software without which we wouldn't be people. You know, I mean, language allows us to explore realms of subtlety and inclusive understanding that so exceed the the animal grasp that it can they can barely be compared. Uh, I think probably in the beginning that language was something that women held almost as a magical power. The reason for this is that there was greater selection, uh, selective pressure on women than on men to develop language because the, the physically larger male, when there began to be role specialization, the physically larger male was made a hunter and hunting places a premium on such values as stoicism, patience, and an ability to keep your mouth shut. The women were involved in gathering, and and because the children were physically with the women, this area in which the gathering went on was more tightly related to the living space. Well, if you know anything about the science of botany, you know that it is a science of the coordination of detail, Everything is about the detail. Here you have 50 species of grasses. To Joe Blow, they all look exactly the same. To a specialist in the Graminae, here is a whole rich universe of taxonomic diversity to be combed over and milked for years as you advance through the academic machinery. So uh, women had to learn all these differentiations. Women had to be able to make statements like, it's the small bush at the bottom of the draw with the wrinkled leaves and the sticky white berries with the silver hairs on them. See, it's all color, shape, form, and relationship words. Well, this kind of language is the kind of language that gave us a leg up on animal organization. After a passage of time, I think this linguistic thing generally established itself. But it it was uh, originally a a thing that women were into. Even to this day, when you go into villages in third world parts of the planet, uh, there's this phrase in all travel books, which is the chattering of the village women. And it's true, they really do chatter. And it's because they are more collective creatures. The male is this proud, lonely, hunting figure, and the females represent, you know, the village values. And they held the knowledge of the plants. They discovered all this stuff. You even get that in the Eden story. It's a woman who's blamed. Somehow these women have a deeper insight, and the poor guy is just led to slaughter because he's (laughs) trying to get some chow. (laughs) Perhaps an appropriate image uh, would be uh, one of uh, climbing a temple. I can always think of Bora Vidur, which is probably the most impressive temple that I've ever visited. But um, there, as you walk up the temple, if you pay attention, you hear having a whole experience of Buddhism and different symbologies, but also just basically your vision of the surrounding jungle expands and your sense of self uh, diminishes. Because you see the larger yeah, world. You see the larger world from up on top. Yeah, from the center of the mandala. Yeah. The same psychology is operating on the Mayan buildings. I mean, the Mayan buildings are barely buildings at all. They're more like pedestals. I mean, this thing is 
you know, 230 feet high, but when you climb to the top of it, there's room for 12 guys to stand shoulder to shoulder, and that's the building. And it's clearly, entirely, to elevate them above the social space. It was literally a machine for lifting the priesthood into another dimension, and the dimension into which it lifted them was an aerial dimension. They could see then the whole world. They could see the sock bays stretching out to the next pyramid. They could see the next pyramid five or ten miles away on the horizon and could see the life of the city and all this. You know, there's a funny thing. Um, it's almost as though biology and then its ancillary tack-on phenomenon culture is a kind of conquest of dimensions that has been going on for a very long time and this aids me anyway in understanding the transformation that I think lies ahead for this planet. The earliest forms of life had only a tactile sense. That means all they knew was what they were bumping up against and they would move around and what was edible was eaten and what wasn't wasn't. And then over a long time passed, you know, 100 million, 200 million years, and certain specialized cells uh, ag uh, aggregated. And these cells were light-sensitive cells. They could send an on-off signal uh, based on whether or not photons were falling on them. So eye spots developed. And eye spots are just these sensors which tell you if it's light or dark. And suddenly these creatures could move off after a light source or could retreat from danger into a dark spot. Well, then uh, eventually these eye spots evolved into the kinds of very finely coordinated optical systems that we have and octopi have and so forth. At the same time, motility was developing, the ability to move through space. Well, have you ever noticed that when you look at something and at a place a few feet from where you're sitting and then go there, physically move there, that what you have really done is you have coordinated a, a short trip into the future because you have looked at a spot and you have said, this is how the brain computer works, it has said, I am not in that place. I want to be in that place. I am in this place now. To get from this place now to that place then, I have to move through the following points. And, and when animals began to move, uh, another dimension was added to their repertoire of control, and when they began to coordinate vision, another dimension was added to their repertoire of control. Well, we made then a great and fundamental break in our neurological organization. All animal life, as far as we can tell, is imprisoned between very steep temporal canyons having to do with the present moment. Animals are in the present moment in, in a way that would be very frightening to us, I think. If you could suddenly enter the mind of an animal, the Im immediate thing that you would notice that would really unnerve you was the absence of a past and a future. That just, you know, you talk about be there now, an animal has that down pat. Well, when we, uh, through language, that was the great... Language is a strategy for binding time. Language is a strategy for taking the animal mind locked in the present moment and pushing it back conceivably to the creation of the universe as we do and forward conceivably to the end of the universe. So, so culture is a strategy for intensifying the dimensionality of an animal species. And uh, the, the, uh, when, when you then get into what's called epigenetic coding, not simply being able to recall the past, 
neurologically and project the future neurologically, but to actually write down the past and calculate the future, well then, what is happening is mind is spreading out through the dimensions available to it. And this whole cultural intensification that we call the 20th century, the spinning down and interconnecting of technologies and, uh, and uh, animal ecosystems and philosophical systems, all this knitting together is a, a going hyperdimensional of our species that yet more of the future and more of the past is apparently to be realized. And if you know anything about virtual reality uh, thinking, there time is to be homogenized completely. I mean, you will not be able to tell whether it's next week or last week because they will be uh, as approximately equally accessible. And uh, somehow the psychedelic experience is related to this bootstrapping process of climbing organizationally from one dimension to another, deeper and deeper into complexity. It's almost as though the psychedelic experience is a viewing of the process from the highest dimension in the plane. One way of putting this that isn't so mathematical is to say what you experience in the psychedelic experience is eternity. All of time, you leave the slowly revolving torus of time, just as one would leave the galaxy in a spaceship, and you go outside, and then you look back, and you see all of time. You see the beginning of life, the end of life, the fiery death of this planet, millennia hence, whatever it is. Uh, and, and I think that this is a true vision, that this is what shamans have achieved, this is what we, with all our sophistication, are confounded by. A shaman is someone who has seen the end. A shaman who is somebody who has seen it all. They've run the movie and run the movie and run the movie and they've satisfied themselves that they understand the movie. Then they go back to their place in the movie and they live it with a small smile because <laughs> they know the end. They know how things work. They know what life is. And when you have even a piece of that action you can get a real handle on peace of mind, on true authenticity, because it's in the tumbling, forward-rushing chaos of the lower-dimensional slices of time that we lose it, that we become confused. Who am I? What do I want? Where am I? Who should I be with? What should I give myself to? This is, the, this is a voice speaking from chaos. I remember once at a period of turmoil in my life, I, I took mushrooms to try and resolve my personal difficulties. And I, and I said, I'll think of a question. You know, they say you should think of a question. So I said, I'll think of a question. The question was, am I doing the right thing? And it's in the point in the trip, I posed this question to it. And the answer was, what kind of a chicken shit question is that <laughs> to ask an extraterrestrial intellect? Well, so then I got it, you know, that that was a chicken shit question and that I had been completely misunderstanding the nature of the relationship. This wasn't some kind of little glass ball that gives yes or no when you turn it upside down. This is... Uh, I don't know, words fail, but nobody to expect psychotherapy for free from anyway. You said something about you know, the beginning and ending of time and stuff, and it sounded like a deterministic model, and I'm very skeptical about that. It does sound like a deterministic model. If the computer's working tonight, I'll show you my model, and you can decide whether it's deterministic or not. No deterministic model 
has any chance of success. There's a built-in flaw, so you don't need to waste time with forms of determinism. This is the kind of stuff they teach you if you study formal philosophy. The problem with determinism is it says uh, everything can't happen anyway except the way that it's happening. Now, the problem with that is that it makes the concept of thinking irrelevant <laughs> because you're thinking what you're thinking because you couldn't think anything else. Therefore, the notion of truth or, or uh, judgment or all of that is completely shot down. So a totally determined universe is the most ultimately uninteresting that there can be. Uh, nevertheless, the universe clearly is, to some degree, highly determined. I mean, we know to within nanoseconds the time of the sunrise tomorrow, and uh, unless there's a serious instability, it will be on time. So there is a degree of predictability. Uh, my rap is sort of divided into two parts, and I'm very shy about the second half. The first half is easy for me. It's that psychedelics are wonderful, you should take them, this is the way to save the world, so forth and so on. The second part of the rap is, here's what I've learned from psychedelics, and then not some general kind of feel-good thing, but something that requires a blackboard and tensor equations of the third degree and so forth and so on. And I'm very shy about putting that out. My personal approach to psychedelics before I realized that you could save the world with them, when I just thought that this was some kind of thing, self-exploration, my notion was what it's good for is ideas. It's for generating ideas. And I don't really like the word generating because you don't generate them, you hunt them. You get in your little boat and you paddle out onto the dark water and then, you know, you put your feet up and you wait and you set your nets and you wait and, uh, you know, sometimes you pull up your nets and something the size of a freight train has gone through them and you just row for sure shit in <laughs> white and sometimes, you know, minnows, trivia, you know, why, do, why does our little finger just fit our nostril? Just, you know, the, the mysteries of the animal body, or all kinds of stuff. But occasionally, and it's worth fishing a lifetime, you know, occasionally something will come into the nets that is not so small as to be trivial and not so large as to be incomprehensible. And this thing can be wrestled with for hours and eventually brought home to show the startled folks back on shore. And this showing the startled folks back on shore is, uh, makes history. All these ideas come out of interaction with these plants. Uh, the number of ideas which when you pick up a straight encyclopedia are to be traced back to uh, herders and people who kept animals. People say, you know, astrology, astronomy. It was invented by people watching their flocks. The calendar, time, was invented by people watching their flocks. All this other, well, they weren't only watching their flocks, they were also watching the uh, cow pies of their flocks for mushrooms. <laughs> and, uh, you know, music, all of these Pythagorean insights into order, I think, come out of uh, this this herding, domesticated animal husbandry, we call it, husbandry, because it's a model of caring for nature. And um, these ideas are the inspiration and the purpose, to my mind, I mean, the, the social purpose, because I can, you know, get rid of my stuff and feel better about how I was abused in childhood and this and that and the other thing with psychedelics. But that's all personal growth stuff. But an idea, you know, can be shared. You can take it and you can lay it at somebody's feet. There are, and, uh, and where do they come from? 
You know, when you ask the question, where do the ideas come from? This is Platonic philosophy 101, ladies and gentlemen. This is why the Greeks gave up fishing to discuss this problem. Where do the ideas come from? And we are no closer to understanding that. And yet, the ideas are the signposts of our destiny. They guide us forward. And yet, we know not from whence nor whither. Well, I think now... uh, You know, so Plato's take on that was he said, well, there must be a perfect world somewhere where all these things exist in some, and the numbers and everything, there's a perfect form for everything in a higher dimensional world called the archetypes. Well, 2,000 years of of, uh, philosophical sophistication have shown certain problems with that point of view, but fewer than you might think. I mean, the mystery of form, the problem of form, what is it? Where does it come from? What sustains it? We are nothing more than form. If it weren't for form, we would be no different than the dirt under our feet. And form intrudes into matter, and then it withdraws. And when it withdraws, They put you in a hole and put dirt on top of you. So it's very important to understand what is this coming and going of form. If we take this pillow and saw it in two, it's um, it's a pretty undramatic event. If we take one of us and saw us in two, it's an extremely dramatic event. Now what is the difference there? It's that this object is three-dimensional, And this object is four-dimensional. This object has a quality about it called being alive. Being alive, also technically known as metabolism, means that material is moving along temporal gradients within the confines of this organism. Material is not moving along any gradients within this thing. It's just where it is. There it sits. But in here, a form is being maintained from within. And if I were to die, the form would collapse. Here, no form is being maintained except the form imposed. This is an imposed form. It has no sense of itself, and it doesn't sustain itself from any kind of internal integrity. But higher dimensional objects, like animals and plants and human beings, have this quality. Well, so then what we've been talking about here, uh, albeit sloppily, is uh, the fact that we seem to occupy a higher dimension in the natural order than other things. And this higher dimension has to do with the fact that we have a little piece of mind, a little chunk of this higher order organization. Well then, going toward that, as visionaries, as users of psychedelics, society keeps um, adjusting its trim tabs, as it were, to mirror this transcendental goal. And this is what we want to become. We want to become like the sensed object in our imagination. And shamanism is a pipeline about this. It's almost as though the, the end state... Well, here's, here's a model for it. It's almost as though the ordinary causal flow of information from the past to the future must make a place for like a 3 to 5% backward flow. And this is what we call intuition. It's that vague, unformed knowing that comes without any baggage of causal mechanism, but but it's true knowledge. You know how it's going to be. Well, it may be that that time is somehow information permeable, that future potential states of existence are actually somehow in resonance with states of existence in the present and in the past. Our models of how the world works are very, very simple. I mean, basically, we operate with mechanical push-pull 
uh, models that are appropriate to very simple mechanical systems. And yet we know that we are far more complex even than uh, you know, the most complex physical systems. Like this, this last 15,000 years has been something. And the last 500 years has really been something. It's so close now, the transcendental object, that it informs everything. The, the, me, the metaphor, the model to hold on in your mind as you gaze at, uh, at the earth in its travail is the metaphor of birth, not death. That uh, a gestation process of 20,000 years is coming to an end. Culture using, language using, minded uh, creatures are coming to some kind of uh, fermentative climax. And we cannot extrapolate the human career on this planet centuries into the future. It ain't going to be like that. It, it's an absurd question to ask the question, what will the, what will the world be like in 500 years? What the world will be like in 500 years is unimaginable because in the next 40 years, we are going to pass through this quantized transition where we actually become insiders and players in the game. History is a state of becoming. It's a state of moving from the inarticulate, unreflecting, animal style of organization to the self-reflecting, minded, conscious, energy-controlling style. But to get from one to the other takes about 20,000 years, and it's a bitch. You don't know where you are. You don't know up from down. You cannot tell what is happening. There's just migrations and warfare and pogroms and gene mixing and hysteria of every sort and Messiah this and religion that and they're slaughtering these people and these people are doing this. And it's like a bad dream. It's like a psychedelic trip is what it's like. It's a fifteen to 25,000 year dash to authentic being from the animal body. And it would have been a lot easier to understand if 10,000 years ago we hadn't cut the telephone wire to nature. Because from then on we haven't been able to figure out what's going on. And it's been left to men with large egos to figure out what was going on. And what they figured out was going on was that there was a lot of free women, land, animals, and money that needed to be organized for their pleasure because they lost the connection to this planetary birth process. Now, uh, and like a birth process, I mean, the metaphor is worth pursuing because a birth is violent, blood is shed, there's moaning and groaning and thrashing around. And yet this is not uh, an automobile accident. This is not a human tragedy. This is how life works. This is centrally scripted in to how human beings operate. If this didn't happen, we wouldn't be here. Well, that's the... And yet, you know, if you've ever been pregnant or been around a pregnant person... This is a wonderful state of equilibrium, of self-satisfaction, of completion. And yet, it, the very fact that it exists ensures that it's going to be rent. It's going to be torn. It's going to end violently in separation of these two beings. But then there are all kinds of births. There's stillbirth, the most disturbing and unsettling of all. There's, you know, breach there's cesarean, there's bad presentation, there's all, there's easy labors, hard labors. And I think this is the choice that we are, we still have some choices left. And a choice still to be made is, is it going to be a hard labor or an easy labor? It's how fast we educate ourselves. That's the lubrication in the birth canal of this pup. How fast we educate ourselves. Are we going to fight it? Or are we going to go with it? And it's, it's really frightening. I mean, because what we want is 
first of all, forgiveness for what we've done, which ain't likely to come. And then we want to go back and paint ourselves blue and be tribal and turn our back on all of this. But I don't think it's going to be like that. It's propelling us to some kind of higher order. I, the faith is that history must have been for something and that uh, everything is to be knitted together and everything is to be reborn anew. And I don't think this is, a, this is not a religious doctrine exactly. It's more like a, the biological faith. I mean, we see it everywhere. We see it in the birth that I was just describing. We see it in the metamorphosis of insects. Uh, you know, Heraclitus said, Pantit Rea, all flows. And I think that this is the, the hardest thing to learn. It certainly has been the hardest thing for me to learn in my life. And I assume then by extrapolation, maybe this is one of the hard things to come to terms with. Everything flows. Nothing lasts. I mean, not the travail, not the horror, you know, not the women you love, not the women who drive you crazy, not the children you love, not the children that drive you crazy. Everything is in the process of changing into something else, even at the very moment that you recognize its, uh, its uh, coherence as an entity. And this is the bad news that the ego doesn't want to hear. This is what the ego is created to deny because the ego is, you know, it's the effort of flesh to make diamond and it can't be done. You cannot make an indestructible, adamantine, clear substance. It can't be done. But... It's all tied up with our fear of death. You know, we assume that if we release ourselves into this flow, we will be swept away, that our identity will cease to exist, that we will somehow not be there. This is a, an artifact of language. It's a horrible misunderstanding about who we are and how, uh, how the whole system is working. Are you using language as a matter well, no, that's all I mean, but I'm really aware of what a funny thing it is. You know, you talk about other dimensions. Language is like an informational creature of some sort. I mean, languages live, they reproduce themselves. Yes, it's a kind of virus. William Burroughs said this. Yeah. He said English is a virus from outer space. I have no quarrel with this. This mm -hmm. seems entirely reasonable. Um, it, it, it's a very strange thing. Reality is made out of language. And for most of the people in this room, it's made out of English. And yet we spend a great deal of time worrying about quarks and, and mu mesons and electromagnetic radiation and, it, and all this is entirely a fiction none of this stuff exists all that exists are words and we play a game a really fairly insidious game with ourselves we all i suppose here give great credence to what is called quantum physics is there anyone here who would care to explain to the group uh, several of the core doctrines of quantum <laughs> physics? Or any core doctrine. And by explain, I don't mean a verbal gloss. I mean give us the hardcore equations. Well, I, no one seems to be coming forth. And yet, this is our truth. How crazy are you if your truth is something you can't even understand? And that's the situation that we're in. We believe that somewhere among us, somebody understands these tensor equations of the third degree. And that if it got real tight, we could go to them and they would then explain what reality is. 
well, this is a head full of shit, this kind of thinking. What you are actually dealing with is what Wittgenstein called the present at hand. The present at hand. Good phrase, because it, it implies that only that which can be grasped matters. And the quark cannot be grasped, the new meson, the electromagnetic field, none of this. These things need to be understood for what they are, which is little shingles, little shingles, which we epoxy on to the face of the universal mystery. And once you have a bunch of these little shingles epoxied onto the face of the mystery, then you can't see the mystery at all anymore, <laughs> and you call that an explanation. Say, well, that's taken care of. We've explained it. By the time a child is eight or nine or five or six, they have covered the entirety of reality with these interlocking little linguistic tiles. And nowhere now is reality to be found. Between ourselves and reality, as quickly as we possibly can, we erect a, a lie. We erect a false set of assumptions that are culture-bound. And this has always impressed me, the culture-bound nature of language, that in a way you can never leave the place you're raised in because you acquire a local language. And the local language is all you ever really have. Mm. I had an experience of this that brought it home to me very strongly because when I first went to the tropics, um, I was there as a professional butterfly collector and it was pretty important to make a living. And, uh, and uh, my impression of the jungle was that it was green. That was my impression. Well, then three years later, I went back with botanists well, if you know anything about botany and taxonomy, what it is, is it's, a, it's an orgy of language. I mean, you know, leaves are lanceolate, uh, crenolate. They have bracts which are sessile, umbilate, and indentified, and so forth. And so these are specialized words to describe structure. You go with a botanist into the jungle, and the jungle becomes unbelievably rich. Here are melanostomes, malfigs, varolas, uh, all kinds of things. And as soon as you put words to it, reality emerges. So you see, here is language as a double-edged sword. Out of the undifferentiated, it creates miraculous new realities to which we immediately habituate undervalue and profane. In other words, familiarity breeds contempt. But somewhere between silence and the familiarity that breeds contempt is the living essence of the word and its meaning. This problem of language is uh, central, I think, to understanding uh, the psychedelic experience. What I see happening on these tryptamines is the project of language goes from being something which you hear to something which you see without ever crossing over a quantized moment of transition. Well, this is to my mind absolutely astonishing and I think I'm a pretty tough nut to crack. When you see language... Your, your, it's amazing because it's a paranormal thing or it's like it's, it cheats it achieves paranormal intensity without violating any of the laws of physics that I'm familiar with what I'm talking about is that in these shamanic performances in the Amazon and on psilocybin uh, language goes from something beheld to something seen uh, there's precedent for this. In the Hellenistic world of, of Greco-Romanism, the be-all and the end-all of spiritual accomplishment was what's called the Logos. And the Logos was an informing voice, a voice in the head that told you the right way to live. 
and Plato and all of these heavies cultivated and achieved connection with the Logos. Well, there was a, a Alexandrian Jew named Philo Judaeus who was a great commentator on the religions of his period. And he wrote uh, about what he called the more perfect Logos. The more perfect Logos. And he said, what is the more perfect Logos? And then he answered his own question. The more perfect Logos goes from being heard to being seen without ever crossing over a quantized moment of transition. Language is something unfinished in us. It's something that was catalyzed out of animal organization by hallucinogenic activation of brain states, and it is something that is in the act of perfecting itself. And when it is completed, my faith is that words will be seen not heard. The whole way in which we organize our language around visual metaphors when we talk about clarity. So if someone is able to communicate, we say, she spoke clearly. That's a visual metaphor. We say, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. That means I understand you. I see what you mean. He painted a picture. It means unconsciously, at the unconscious level, we connect visual metaphors and the visual sense with clarity of understanding. And what's happening in the ayahuasca cults, in the mushroom intoxications and so forth, is an invocation of the visible logos. It comes into being in the shared space. You control it with sound. I mean, you, you discover that sound is something that you can see. And this is, I referred to this this morning and when I talked about how we may be a one gene mutation away from a transformation of language. You can sit, feel perfectly normal, not feel wired or depressed, not have visual activity in the visual field, and then you generate a tone like... And you see that it's a certain shade of lemon yellow with a chartreuse edge running on it. And then you... And it shifts to pink blue. Well, you begin to experiment with this and you discover very quickly that you can do more than just generate colors. You can generate modalities. You can generate shapes as you begin to relax into an unconscious expression of syntax, form begins to behave itself in the space in front of you.